Hello, everyone. This is Dean Edwards, International Coordinating Editor for Democracy Watch News in Salem, Oregon. Welcome you all to our newsroom and another episode of Democracy Cast Weekly News Briefings. Going to go in a little bit different order today due to pressing circumstances. We're going to start with John Harvey in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, our chief information officer who Gratefully, uh, we are very grateful to him for setting up this call and managing this event. And he's going to be functioning as our chief international correspondent to give us his weekly technology report. And we'll be going to Mark Taylor Canfield, who'll give us some information from the great city of Seattle, the Emerald City, and then back to me. So that's our schedule for today. We look forward to hearing the technology report and updates from Seattle, Washington. So, John, in Pittsburgh, I know you're pressed for time. What have you got for us today? Thanks, Dean. So today we're going to continue on with the Facebook saga, um, or the, let me correct myself, the meta book, meta, meta saga. I, I just can't get used to that name after so many years. For those of you that don't know, meta is the new name of the holding company, and Facebook is now just a product. But it's interesting to note that everyone's been talking about the metaverse and how Microsoft and Meta and others, uh, including NVIDIA, have been making announcements about what they're going to be doing. Recently, however, both Microsoft and Facebook announced a joint venture, which I find very interesting. Uh, Facebook work app, is going to integrate with Microsoft Teams. And this is really what is needed for the you know, so-called metaverse to come to fruition, is the ability to transverse the metaverse without having to go into one app and then another and close down an app and worry about where something is located. So, you know, it's a very good first step in the right direction, in my opinion. Today, we're gonna to continue to talk a little bit more about the history of communications and um, you know, how we got here and why you know, none of this is surprising. The metaverse, for instance, didn't just come out of thin air. And we're gonna go back to 1436 when Johannes Gutenberg is credited with inventing the printing press. And you know, Gutenberg actually didn't, um, really make any money out of it. He, he, I believe, died before the actual fruition of his product came to light. Um, and the first printing was 200 copies of the Bible, but that took three years. And so, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of things happen in three years. The People that were aware of this didn't come flocking to you know, the, the, the printing press place to buy the Bible. What made printed words possible was the fact that shortly after the printing press, people figured out that to make this effective, one needed to develop a way of distributing the word, getting the word across. And so one of the methods that they did or used was to print a couple of books or a run of books and then give them to various sea captains that were going off to um, America, for instance. And once there, they would also print off pamphlets and various other things that um, once there, a local printer could copy them and then distribute that. And that's really how we started seeing mass communication kick into gear where you know finally people didn't have to take the priest's word for what was contained in the bible they could now read the bible themselves and that was very controversial as you can imagine during those times but you know it goes to the fact that information needs to propagate and it's up to people to move this information forward. So, you know, what we have is this information arriving, say, in the new world, as I said, uh, here in the United States. Uh, and 
not everyone could afford to buy these pamphlets. And so one of the ways that information was propagated as a result of the Prince of Word again, was that we had people, town criers, if you will, that read off the news. People are hungry for information. People are hungry for gossip. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that fake news is so prevalent is that it's entertaining that you know people want to be taken out of their little worlds and words do that they have a way of taking us to another place whether it's real or not and that really is part of the problem that you know we're dealing with today hopefully People should have more common sense or the ability to think critically and know when something is a parody or know when something is not true and make informed decisions. But, you know, the important thing here is getting the word out. And we continue to come up with technological innovations that really builds off these first inventions where they were developed to help people communicate, to get people to realize that there is a wider world around them. And, you know, hopefully people still read and people still look at great works like Aristotle, Plato, etc., and use them to come to an understanding of the world. So that's it for me today, and uh, we'll see you next week. This is John Harvey from Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thanks, John. And next, we're going to go to Seattle, Washington, the Emerald City. Jeff Santos likes to call him the Renaissance Man because Mark does so many different things with so many talents. We're fortunate to have him with us, not only in the policy role as executive director, but also in his administrative capacity as vice president of our new service. And finally, not the very least, besides being a contributor to Democracy Watch News, Mark is also our editor for Press Freedom. So Mark, what have you got to report to us today? Well, all around the world, as I've been reporting, there have been crackdowns on freedom of the press, uh, including uh, an Iranian photojournalist, Rahil Musavi, was arrested on unspecific charges. Uh, that's breaking today from the Committee to Protect Journalists. Iranian authorities um, are being called upon by CPJ to immediately release the Arab Iranian photojournalist and to drop any charges against her and to let her work freely. Um, that's a quote from uh, Committee to Protect Journalists today. Uh, and what happened on that story is that on November 9th, security forces with the intelligence ministry arrested Musavi, a freelance journalist in the southwestern uh, area of um, Iran. Authorities have not specified the reason for her arrest or disclosed any charges against her, uh, according to these reports. Um, it's also been reported by the US-based human rights activist news agency and the exile run news website, Iran Wire. So according to uh, CPJ's Middle East and North Africa program coordinator, Sharif Mansbur, Iranian authorities must release the photojournalist immediately and unconditionally and let her do her job documenting the lives of Arab minorities in Iran. Journalists must be able to work without fear that they will be arbitrarily detained. Um, uh, she has an Instagram site where uh, she has 5,300 followers. Um, and if you want to find that site uh, to try to support the situation, uh, this is how you, you spell her name, R-H, R-A, excuse me, R-A-H-I-L, Rahil, uh, M-O-U-S-A-V-I. And so you can also go to cpj.org, the Committee to Protect Journalists, to um, find the, the latest on this. A source familiar with the case has told CPJ on a uh, condition of anonymity that citing fear of reprisal, um, she publishes most of her photos on social media such as Instagram because local media outlets refuse to publish her content for fear that'll create problems for them with Iran's censors. So that's one of the breaking stories that you'll find today um, internationally 
and in terms of uh, news about journalism. And I do want to give a shout out to uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, also Reporters Without Borders. In the United States, there's also the group Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. They've all been doing a really good job with their limited resources and trying to um, get these stories out to the world because in many cases, uh, the stories are not being told in their home countries. And so it's almost up to uh, media and activists outside of the country to even get these stories out. Uh, recently, there's also been, um, a CPJ has also a, uh, sent out an alert about the killing of a Ye Yemeni journalist uh, in a car bomb attack. And all parties to that conflict in Yemen have been accused of attacking members of the press. And so CPJ is um, speaking out against that and demanding that that situation be thoroughly investigated. Uh, that's uh, Rasha Abdullah Al Khazari. And um, the journalist was killed in a car bomb attack uh, just recently. And uh, he, you know, Al Hazari was pregnant at the time, and those reports, uh, her husband, who is also a journalist, was seriously injured in the blast and has been hospitalized, according to those reports. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, according to the Associated Press. Uh, however, um, Al, -Hazar, Al Harazi uh, worked for the Emirati News Channel, uh, Al Ain and Al Shark, uh, according to the Associated Press and a report by the Saudi satellite news channel, Al Arabia. She worked as a journalist, uh, a photographer and camera operator, and also for the UAE based Bloomberg Ashgard a collection of the US business newswire and Saudi government tied Saudi research and media group. So according to some people that are familiar with her work, uh, they also spoke to CPJ on an anonymity. And this is a situation where all over the country um, CPJ has security issues in um, communicating with journalists and activists, human rights um, uh, observers to try to get these stories out um, without uh, retribution in these countries. So it must be noted that um, there has been in general reported by the Committee to Protect Journalists and by Reporters Without Borders, a uh, increase in uh, attacks on the press and on journalists around the world. Um, it's not just in any particular part of the world or any particular continent. This is happening um, worldwide. So if you want to find more information about that, you can go to the Reporters Without Borders website and that's available at rsf.org. Um, you have uh, an ongoing count by the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Without Borders on the number of journalists who are currently uh, in prison um, or have been killed. And according to Reporters Without Borders, as of November 11th, uh, Veterans Day, formerly Armistice Day of 2021, 37 journalists have been killed worldwide. One citizen journalist was killed and four media assistants have been killed. Um, there's also, of course, uh, journalists who have been imprisoned, and that's a whole other story that we can get into during my next report. But I think it's just important, especially for a North American audience, to realize that uh, freedom of the press and um, issues in, in regarding the security and safety of uh, press around the world has really come to the forefront in many countries uh, and unfortunately is probably not getting the kind of uh, reportage and coverage that it should in the United States. Uh, but it is an issue um, and there were a lot of problems in the United States with reporters trying to enter the United States uh, during the Trump administration when um, border officials would uh, you know, confiscate cameras and things like that. So. The United States currently is ranked 44th in the world in terms of press freedom. Uh, Reporters Without Borders will be coming out with a new study uh, next year. And uh, we can only hope that there will be an improvement 
in our ranking. The United States used to be ranked uh, up there around 19 before the 2011 Occupy Wall Street protests when uh, police began uh, uh, harassing and uh, arresting reporters at protests. And ever since then, and also since the Trump administration, especially uh, our ranking on the World Press Freedom Index, which you can find at the Reporters Without Borders website has been steadily declining. Um, we have improved four points over the last couple of years. It was down at 48 at one time, and then we right, rose up to 45th, and now we're at 44th. Um, but if you look at the uh, list of countries and regions on the Reporters Without Borders website and check out the, the World Press Freedom Index, you'll be very shocked, I think, uh, if you live in North America about the United States' ranking compared to other countries. Um, and it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a very instructive exercise to look at the list and see what's going on. Because I can tell you right now that we're at number 44. Um, and if you go up the list, you'll find that uh, there are other Western nations that are way ahead of us. Um, Norway and Finland are um, usually over the last few years, they have been number one and number two, and that continues today. Um, Sweden, is uh, number three, Denmark is number four, so the Scandinavian countries, but Costa Rica is number five, actually, um, and Jamaica is seventh. So uh, we have countries in other parts, uh, other hemispheres that are doing better than the United States. Um, and uh, Samoa is one of those places, they're number 21. Um, Namibia is number 24 as compared to the United States. We, we being at 44th. So it's definitely something that I've been um, trying to get information out about this ranking, this index that takes place every year. And Reporters Without Borders also gives background information on how they came to these, uh, how they got these statistics, what their analysis is in order to, um, to uncover countries that are violating press freedom. Um, at the very bottom, you will find uh, countries that have traditionally, especially recently, been very nasty for journalists, uh, including countries like, of course, North Korea and China, um, Iran uh, are way, way down. And uh, North Korea is 179, China is 177. Saudi Arabia is 170. Um, and Egypt is not much farther ahead, they're at 166. Russia, um, which has recently been designating journalists as foreign agents is at 150. So the, the principle and the, the, both the, the infrastructure, the dynamics and the acceptance of press freedom is not universal around the globe. Um, there are many parts of the world where press freedom is uh, not accepted as the norm. Uh, this is Mark Taylor Canfield. Ex uh, with Democracy Watch News, the editor for Press Freedom, and I'll continue to bring you more interesting statistics and reports from instances around the world uh, where reporters and the freedom of the press are being challenged. This is Mark Taylor Canfield from Seattle. Thank you, Mark. This is Dean Edwards coming back to you from Salem, Oregon. I'm going to give a quick report on today's events at COP26 for the 11th of November of 2021. The, the conference ends tomorrow, our time as of this recording. Of course, you'll be hearing this in the past tense, but this is a live recording, so you get to hear it as it comes in. What's happening today uh, on the 11th, on Thursday, was that the, small, the Alliance of Small Island States, the cities all had representative spokespeople there on the, on the dais uh, speaking to the, the group along with a couple of very interesting panels. The Secretary General spoke, the US representatives spoke. Also, the, the young activists from Africa were participating in, uh, fully in, the, in this uh, conference. It was a stark contrast to to uh, previous uh, iterations of the International Forum on the Climate Disaster. 
And that's the term that they're using now. Uh, make no mistake about it, the world is in trouble. We, the clock is ticking. We're eight minutes to midnight, add a, add a tick every year to the end of this decade. That's pretty much my analogy for the rest of the decade, according to what I'm hearing. There were four major areas that were covered and, and activities going on, one of which is the, is the Glasgow Business Alliance, which involves a lot of private industry and non-state actors around the world who are active in, the, in free enterprise and business. Another is the, the race for the cities. And the third one that they talked about was a race to zero. And those are all programs and activities you're going to be hearing more about. But there's a new issue that's been added to this and there's been a lot of, of controversy over it as countries that, such as Africa, which amounts to, accounts for 3% of global emissions is being saddled with huge consequences and damages, lost to culture, lost to historical sites, lost to coastline, the damages are difficult to, to assess. They're asking for compensation. They're asking for, for damages for this. And, and that is an issue you're gonna be hearing more about, about how we deal with damages, how we deal with, with, with other factors relating to damages. They're asking for contributions, serious contributions from the international community, particularly those members were responsible for bringing us to this point. So that was COP today. I want to shift my emphasis to being president of the news service for a moment to talk about why we exist and why we are reporting to you at all. It has come to our attention over this past decade that the United States in particular and the world in general is at a crisis of democracy. This is a moral moment for us. It's a cause for pause. And as journalists, we have a responsibility to meet that, that problem, to meet those problems, to, to deal with, with our, our responsibility for holding the public trust that gives us special privileges on the world scene and nationally. So Democracy Watch will be here we will continue to report on events and people and activities that are significant for building and sustaining healthy democracies around the world and the issues that relate to that. That's my quick summary for you. I wanna thank you for joining us here at Democracy Watch News for another issue of Democracy Cast, our weekly news briefings. And I might add one final thing, keep an eye on Sudan. Last week we did a, an extended report on what's going on in Sudan on the 13th of this month. Take a look at what happened on the 13th or will happen on the 13th. There'll be a nationwide effort there. Last time there were 5 million people out in the streets. I would not be surprised from what I'm hearing to see that exceeded. So keep an eye on the Sudan, keep an eye on Swaziland. Elections in the Gambia coming up. We'll have more for you in upcoming episodes. This is Dean Edwards, International Coordinating Editor for Democracy Watch News, signing off from Salem, Oregon, inviting you to join us again next week.